I'm really thrilled to welcome everyone here today. It's a very important occasion. My name is Carl Gershman. I'm the president of the National Endowment for Democracy, and we're just really thrilled to be able to have you here with us today on this very important occasion. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the NEDS Democracy Award Ceremony, which this year is taking place, as you all know, on the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Our event this evening is intended to, as a demonstration of solidarity with the continuing struggle for freedom and democracy in China, but also as an act of remembrance of those Chinese citizens, most of them very young, who gave their lives in the hope that China would become a democratic country respectful of human dignity and the rule of law. We are here to testify that they did not die in vain. I want to thank the many donors who have made this event possible and who are listed in your program. Among them, NED board members and former board members, Eileen Donahoe, Mano Camporis, Marlene Colucci, Michelle Dunn, Bob Tuttle, and George Weigel the John Herford Foundation, the Bricklayers and Steelworkers Union, the Ambassador Stanley Gao from the Tech Row Office of Taiwan in Washington, and we're grateful to them all. We're also honored to be joined this evening by many members of Congress. Now, I think as some of you have heard, there are votes on, and when you're on the Hill, nothing is well organized. <laughs> so I want to – I've written in my notes because I thought she would be here at this time, but she's coming. Speaker Pelosi will be here, and when she, I just want to say before she gets here that she is, as everyone knows, she's incredibly devoted to the cause of human rights in China and Tibet, as well as Liz Cheney, who is here, the House Republican Conference Chair. Jim McGovern will be joining us, Mike McCall, they're all not here right now, Tom Suozzi, uh, who will be, be presenting awards this evening, but there'll be some changes, don't worry. We'll get through this. Chris Smith, I don't know if he's still here, but I saw him. He left, okay, but I, you know, we all know Chris. He's a hero uh, in this struggle, and he co-chairs the Tom Lantos Human Rights Caucus with Jim McGovern. Uh, John Moulinar was supposed to be here, Sheila Jackson Lee. I just saw uh, French Kill from Louisiana. We just were talking, and thank him. He has a strong interest in human rights. Um, and. Is, is Congressman, former Congressman Frank Wolf here? He was supposed to be here, but I was told that he was going to be here, but okay. Even if he's not here, I want to say that Frank was supposed to be here, and he's a terrific, <laughs> for 30, more than 30 years, he was a great defender for, of human rights. And Ileana ross Lettinen, who is a new member of the NED board, another heroine in the fight for human rights, uh, now a member of the NED board, and she was coming in from the airport, and she'll be here. I know she'll be here because as we all know, nothing stops Ileana. Uh, and I want to welcome, where's Weir Kashi? Weir Kashi is somewhere here. There he is, over there. Okay, Weir Kashi, who was one of the key student leaders of the Tiananmen protests, and he took part in the abortive negotiations with Li Peng and other Chinese officials before the Chinese regime chose the path of repression over dialogue. Finally, You'll see on the screens around you, I think they're going to put some signs there. And, you know, we've been in touch with our friends in Hong Kong, and they have just held a candlelight vigil attended by 180,000 people. And we're sort of doing this in partnership. So feel yourself connected. And so you have pictures of it there. And it's, this is the only place where Tiananmen Square is is recognized and remembered in what is formerly today China. And the people in Hong Kong, as we know, are struggling to keep the independence and the rights that they have, even though, Ileana, I just talked about you. I talked about you. I said nothing would stop you from getting here because nothing ever stops you. Okay. Ileana, how can you do anything without Ileana? The 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre takes place at a moment when Americans and others around the world have come to the realization that China's dramatic economic growth has not produced a more liberal 
an open country as so many people hoped that it would, but rather a more closed and increasingly repressive authoritarian state that poses a growing danger to democracy around the world. The late Chinese dissident and Nobel laureate, Liu Xiaobo, foresaw this danger. And he warned about it, and for that he paid a very, very heavy price, as we know. His message to us was that it is in the vital interest of all democratic countries and freedom-loving people to rescue the world's largest hostage population from enslavement. Within that hostage population, no groups are more threatened than those represented here this evening by our three awardees. The Tibetan and Uyghur peoples, notice that I don't call them minorities, I call them peoples, because they are peoples. <laughs> who are victims, who are victims of what the Dalai Lama has called cultural genocide. And religious believers among the Han majority, especially the house church movement and the rural Christian underground. The fact that each of these groups faces a common existential threat to its culture, its language, its identity, and its faith, reveals what is the central feature of the Chinese state, that it sees anything it cannot control as a threat to its power. Such a system is inherently insecure and unstable, which calls to mind Ronald Reagan's statement in his Westminster Address, which was the address that launched the NED, that the innate human desire for freedom will leave such a closed and repressive system. As he said at the time, 1982, he was talking about Marxist-Leninism and the Soviet Union, on the ash heap of history, as it has left other tyrannies which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. As difficult as conditions are today, we must never forget what Liu Xiaobo said in the closing statement at his trial, that China will, in the end, become a nation ruled by law where human rights are supreme. We cannot give up that hope. Since 1991, the NED has given, as its democracy award, a replica of the goddess of democracy, the 33-foot statue that was unveiled in Tiananmen Square a few days before June 4th to shouts of long live democracy. It was really built to raise the morale of people, when, which was getting a little bit low toward the end, and hundreds of thousands of people flooded into the square when that statue was raised. And this replica is the work of Tom Marsh. I don't know if Tom is with us today. Is Tom here? Okay, well, Tom is a, is a great friend, a real true Democrat. He is the one who did the other statue that was unveiled today, the Tank Man statue that they had a ceremony on. Frank, there you are, I spoke about you. <laughs> I said, you're great, <laughs> and we miss you. I want you to know that we miss you. Okay, okay. In any event, this, this replica that Tom did, this statue was destroyed when the Chinese tanks attacked the protesters on June 4th, but its image lives on, and it has since become a symbol of the universality of the democratic idea. Resembling our own Statue of Liberty, it affirms that democracy is an idea that transcends cultural differences, and it repudiates the notion that some have circulated around town these days, that China and the United States are at odds because of a clash of civilizations. The clash is not one of tradition, religion, and culture. It is about the values of freedom and human dignity. And Speaker Pelosi, who we will hear from in a, in, in this, during the, in, a, in a little while, participated, has participated actually in nine of our Democracy Award events over the years, and has presented this goddess of democracy to four Chinese activists since 1993, to Hong Dong Fang, the labor activist, to Wang Dan, 
and Wei Jing Sheng after they got out of prison in 1998. And then on the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen Square, she presented our goddess of democracy in absentia to Lu Xiaobo, who was in prison at the time. All of these people exemplify universal democratic values, as do our awardees this evening. Our country was founded upon these values, which is why it is so appropriate to present this award in our nation's capital to freedom fighters from Tibet, from East Turkestan, notice I don't say Xinjiang, to East Turkestan, <laughs> and China. And it is now my great pleasure to invite Andy Card, who is the chairman of the NED board and a great Democrat with a small d. <laughs> he was going to introduce Nancy Pelosi, so that was part of the joke. He's now going to introduce Liz Cheney, but Nancy will be here. Andy. Well, thank you, Carl. And the National Endowment for Democracy is a wonderful organization. Uh, President Reagan, with the support of Congress, created the National Endowment for Democracy to plant seeds of democracy around the world. And clearly, the seeds have been planted in places where they need to be planted. And they're starting to bear fruit. But they need a lot more fertilizer. They need a lot more water. And quite frankly, we need some more seeds. Uh, Liz Cheney is someone who also knows how to talk about democracy and make sure that people are engaged in it. She comes from a state that was the first state to have women's suffrage. And it, <laughs> Wyoming, in 18, I think it was 1869, women got the right to vote in Wyoming. This is the 100th anniversary today of the 19th Amendment to our Constitution being passed by Congress and sent to the states for ratification. It didn't, ratification didn't happen until, I think it was August 18th, 1920. So Liz carries a torch for democracy and she does it extremely well. Uh, she's been a phenomenal member of Congress, a relatively young member of Congress. But she has one of the more prominent leadership roles for her party in Congress. She is a significant voice for foreign policy and national security. Before she represented the people of Wyoming uh, as their representative in the House, she was at the State Department. I had the privilege of working closely with her as she was a stalwart of great courage to make sure that we were doing the right things to help spread democracy around the world. And she was the pr principal deputy assistant secretary of state for the Middle East. In November of last year, Congresswoman Cheney was elected by her colleagues to the role of chair of the House Republican Caucus. That's the third ranking member of the Republican members of Congress. And Ned is honored that she is here today. She has had a working relationship with Ned and the cause for democracy for a very long time. So she is, she is young, but she is very mature in her compassion for, com for making sure that democracy spreads. I'm thrilled to call her a friend, but I'm even more excited to call her a leader in Congress, a leader for women, a leader for democracy, and now she's going to present an award. Well, thank you very much, Andy. I, I uh, want to make sure the rest of the room knows that when uh, Ambassador Card said that I was a young member of Congress, uh, Congresswoman Ross Lightnin pointed out that it's all relative here in the halls of Congress. So <laughs> but I am I'm so proud uh, to be here today and um, honored to be part of this ceremony. As Andy mentioned, I have a very long relationship with Ned, longer then I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say, because it'll tell you how old I really am. But one of my very first jobs when I finished college was to work at USAID. And I was working at USAID in June of 1989. And one of the first projects we worked on uh, was doing our very best to try to get fax machines into the students in China. 
And if you think about that, at that time, fax machines were the height of technology, the height of ability to communicate. But um, those scenes from Tiananmen captured the world. And uh, it is so important for us to be here today, for us to be able to, to celebrate uh, what happened in the fight for freedom, to remember what happened in terms of, of the real slaughter and, and uh, the response of the government of China. Uh, and to make sure that, that, that every government around the world, every repressive government knows not just America is watching, but the whole world is watching. And in today's world, we see everything. But it, it, it has not been just the advent of modern technology that has helped us spread the words of freedom. And uh, I see so many friends in the audience, people like Ken Wallach and Michelle Dunn, both of whom I've worked with uh, on, on issues and efforts to help promote freedom. Um, we just had the opportunity about a month ago to have a visit here in the halls of Congress from a young man named Enrique Padron who escaped. He was a boat person. He escaped from Cuba. And um, when I was talking to Enrique, he came to the U.S. in 1994, um, and he was a young boy. And I said to him, what gave you courage? What, you know, in 1994 there wasn't internet, um, and how was it that you knew that you would be willing to risk getting on a boat, crossing shark-infested waters, to come to the United States? What, what was that drive in you? He said, it was Ronald Reagan's speeches. And I said, well, how in the world did you hear those? He said, Radio Libre. And he said, our neighbors, sometimes we would have to put blankets over our head. We would have to tune our radios just right. We couldn't let anybody else know we were listening. But I heard those words of freedom. And it made me know I had to get to that place. And that is the kind of place America has to be today and always. And we have to make sure that those who are fighting for freedom all around the world know that we will always stand with you, that we will always stand on behalf of freedom. We've seen this both continuing in China with the repression that we've seen across the board. And the Chinese government has to know that we fundamentally believe and we know that the rights of man, the rights of a person to be free, those are rights that are inherent. We believe they come from God. They do not come from a government, and they cannot be stomped out by a government. So as we watch across the globe today, you have my assurance as a member of the House. You have the assurance of all the members that you've seen here. You'll have the assurance this is an absolutely bipartisan commitment, with Speaker Pelosi speaking here as well today. An absolutely bipartisan, ironclad commitment on the behalf of the United States Congress to make sure that we are, at all times and in all places, standing for freedom. And it is uh, with uh, honor now, I think I'm not giving an award, but our um, ranking member on the Homeland Security Committee, Mr. Uh, oh, sorry, Foreign Affairs Committee, previously Homeland Security, um, Mr. McCall has come in. I don't want to mess up your program, Carl. <laughs> okay, wonderful. But let me just end by saying congratulations very much um, to the Tibet Action Institute, to the World Uyghur Congress, to Tibet Aid, to those who are here today to be awarded this wonderful uh, memento, and, and the gratitude. Those of us in the United States who have the blessing of being able to live in freedom um, really need to stop, I think, every day and remember what it means. And we need to stop and remember what we do in this building. What we do in this building, what we're all going to rush out here to do, to go to the floor of the House, to cast our votes, we get to do that because we live in freedom and because throughout history, brave men and women have fought and died for that freedom. And that struggle and that fight continues today. I know of no more important obligation we have as Americans and as elected officials in the United States than to support those cries and those calls for freedom. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you to Ned. Thank you to Carl, Andy. Um, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm very honored and blessed to be with you today. So thank you so much. We're going to move the program along.
Congressman Mike McCall is someone who has been passionate about so many things that impact the ability for us for, to have freedom and democracy. And he's been a leading national security uh, member of Congress. He's been a foreign policy expert that we've turned to in Congress for many, many years. He served as chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security. Now he's the ranking member there. And throughout his time, he has been a tremendous friend to Ned and the cause for democracy and freedom. Uh, throughout his time, he's also managed to deal with cybersecurity problems and the, the current challenges that are not just challenges to commerce or privacy, they're challenges to democracy. They're tools of democracy and challenges to democracy. And I know that. So I am thrilled that he is here to help present the first award that we're going to give out. So Ned is proud of the friendship that we have with you, Mike. And we're grateful for your participation and the support that you give us. And you invite us to have bipartisan support. And we do. The board is very bipartisan. The support from Congress is very bipartisan. So I'll call you to come up and present the first award. Thank you, Andy. I, um, I, I chaired Homeland Security, and now I'm the, what they call, ranking member on uh, foreign affairs, and uh, I really enjoyed that assignment. And it, it takes me right uh, into this uh, arena uh, with Ned. And um, Andy, I want to thank you, Secretary Card. Um, you know, as a cabinet member uh, for President Bush 41 and Chief of Staff for President Bush 43, I miss both of them a great deal right now. Uh, <laughs> You've really been, <laughs> I, can, I think I speak for everybody. Uh, you've been, a, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> you've been a real model, a public servant for the nation, and um, grateful for your hard work after the 9-11 terror attacks and uh, your advocacy on behalf of women's rights in Afghanistan and efforts to fight infectious diseases in the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, with the PEPFAR program, which, which I think truly is one of Bush 43's greatest legacies, is what he did with PEPFAR, saving millions of lives from extinction. Um, 30 years have passed since the brutal crackdown on democracy, activists in Tiananmen Square. I vividly and personally remember the images of a communist regime attempting desperately to silence the voices of the Chinese people. One image I'll never forget was a very brave man who stood in front of the line of tanks and fearlessly stared down the regime. Although the protests were suppressed and the crowds were forcibly dispersed, those who stood together did not give up their fight. The dream of a better future for China, a more democratic future, is alive and well today. Democracy activists and human rights champions have mounted pressure against the Chinese Communist Party for many years. Their courageous cause has been passed on to new generations who are willing to fight and fulfill that dream. And in fact, we were uh, voting right after this on the Tiananmen Square resolution uh, that I managed on the House floor uh, today. And we're very proud to support our support uh, against the regime in China and for the people of China in that resolution. <laughs> So our first uh, honoree today, China Aid, and the group's founder and president, and I must say a fellow Texan. <laughs> Midlander, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Bob Fu represents that legacy. He refused to surrender the dream of a free China, where all religions can worship peacefully. Bob is a noble example to others. China Aid has worked to expose the human rights abuses in China and is one of the loudest voices calling for the end of China's arbitrary and brutal role. Their mission is to expose, encourage, and equip, and that is to expose the brutality of the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party, encourage others to stand up for the rule of law and the freedoms they deserve, and equip citizens across China with the tools and skills they need to make a difference. While striving to defend freedoms for those still in China, uh, Bob has come back to my home state of Texas, and we welcome you. Um, and let me just say this. We had a great visit in my office about um, 
the crackdown on the, the Uyghur population, the Muslims, the crackdown on the Christians in China, and then the crackdown on the Tibetans in China, all three different religions not able to express their religious freedoms in China. And it's been going on for more than six years, and that time has now come. That time must end. And we need to stand up for the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people. We need to stand up for the Christian people in China. We need to stand up for the Uyghur population, the Muslims, who are literally sitting, as the DOD told me, in concentration camps today in China, about three million of them. This cannot stand any longer. Uh, but with that, on the more positive note, I want to offer my congratulations to Bob Fu and offer this award to him. Thank you, Congressman McCall, um, for your unwavering support for freedom. Thank you, Dr. Carl Gresham um, and NED for recognizing our, uh, we are so um, humbled and privileged uh, to stand here. I want to also thank my uh, fellow board members. Um, many of them uh, travel from the People's Republic of Texas, <laughs> and um, I became a naturalized citizen <laughs> over there. But um, I really want to uh, thank our fellow freedom fighters uh, from uh, other faith communities, um, from our Tibetan uh, friends, from the Uyghur friends, from Falun Gong friends. When the Chinese Communist Party attack one group, when we cannot practice faith from one group of faith, none of our faith is free. So when the attack us, no matter it's Christians, no matter it's uh, Catholics, I mean, no matter it's uh, Uyghur Muslims, no matter, no matter it's uh, the uh, Tibetan Buddhist, none of us is free. And I really, uh, I'm very thankful that today we can join hands together with one voice and uh, tell the Chinese Communist regime, enough is enough. Yeah. I think in the past few days, we already have heard enough words about the atrocities, the inhuman tr treatment uh, for all the faith communities, the one to three million Uyghur in the concentration camps, and the over 150 uh, uh, the Tibetans self emulated themselves, the thousands of uh, Falun Gong practitioners were killed, and over 100,000 Chinese Christians in the year 2018 were detained imprisoned, and many of them are still in prison today, waiting, or some are waiting for their trial. I think it's time for action. Since we are now sitting in the Hall of Congress, I think instead of, uh, you know, naming more names about those who are persecuted, I just want to make one proposal to especially to members of Congress that I think we can make a difference. And my proposal actually will be pleased by both the fiscal conservatives and the progressive progressives because it does not need to increase any existing funding. It's just to need a little bit relocation, relocation of the existing appropriation bills. <laughs> and guess what? The Chinese Communist Party, you know, fear, one of the things they fear most is the freedom of information. 
In 2016, a young man called Zhang Haitao in Xinjiang was sentenced to 19 years imprisonment. For what? He was just a cell phone salesman. He was accused of leaking state secret. When the prosecutor presented evidence, the only piece of evidence was he was accused of uh, by, leak, by uh, forwarding 274 Twitter messages through the Chinese social media. 274 messages through social media. 19 years imprisonment. And almost 10 years ago, another guy from Xinjiang called Alimujiang uh, Imiti, he's a Uyghur and became a Christian pastor. He received 15 years imprisonment. The charge, he was accused leaking state secret. The only piece of state secret for a Uyghur farmer in Xinjiang, or East Turkestan, was he told one of American Christian friends in Xinjiang that he was under investigation. That's the only piece of uh, evidence. 15 years, because the Communist Party is built by lies after lies. They don't want, know, they don't want to know the world to know the truth about their atrocity. They don't want to, uh, their, their, the 1.3 billion people to know that their fellow citizens had been persecuted. So my proposal is really to ask uh, our member of Congress to help on the, on the appropriation bill to the uh, funding the, the uh, US agency uh, uh, for global media, formerly known as the BBG, just to change a little bit from that already exact existing appropriation. And do you know currently how much percentage out of that $770 million annual budget that designated for internet circumvention tools to break the 21st century internet burning wall. Less than 1%, less than 1%. So my plea and request to our member of Congress is to help, at least, you know, help the BBG or the agency and the State Department to raise at least 10% so that one day the 200,000 Iranians can have their town hall meetings without worrying about being caught by having the internet circumvention tools that are already available and uh, really existing. So that one day a pastor like me or any other house church pastors can conduct a house church service from Midland, Texas, or Houston, or Washington, D.C., with the half a million Chinese house church members worship online together. I think the world will be safer and better and much freer when we tear down that internet firewall of the People's Republic of uh, Amnesia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, joining us for the first time this evening is a, a member of Congress who has uh, a passion for what we do. And Tom Swazi is from Long Island, New York. I went to Kings Point, so I know your district well. Have great friends in Glencoe. <laughs> and he's a bipartisan leader on human rights. And he's been working very hard on the corruption issues for a long time in democracy. He's a member of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, the CECC. He's established a record of bipartisanship and he's the vice chairman of a group that we should all be paying attention to.
the Problem Solvers Caucus. <laughs> and so we, we're counting on him to lead us to solutions. He's certainly been a, a strong advocate for the National Endowment for Democracy, and he's going to present our uh, next award. And thank you very much for being here, Tom. Well, after that last speaker, I should start by saying, tear down that wall, tear down that wall, tear down that wall, tear down that wall. I, uh, I want to start off by saying, uh, let's hear it for the Tibet Action Institute. I, I practice some Tibetan today. Are there any Tibetans in here? Raise your hand if you're Tibetan, okay? Hello, Tibetans. Thank you for your work. I, uh, I think that we've all believed ever since, you know, uh, since I was a little boy, you know, when Nixon went to China, and since that time, we've always believed that the more the Chinese were exposed to our way of life, to our democracy, to our capitalism, to the Western world, that they would adopt our ideas, that they would become more like us, and that just hasn't happened in any way, shape, or form. And I'd love to speak to you about all these different groups that we are recognizing tonight. But I just want to join with all of you in congratulating a one particular agency for the work that they're doing and ask them to come and speak for themselves. Let's hear it again for the Tibet Action Institute. And Laden will come up and accept the award. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman Swazi, very much for this um, incredible introduction. And thank you to the National Endowment for Democracy uh, for this incredible honor and for standing in steadfast solidarity with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people for decades. In June 1989, I was 13 years old, watching coverage of the students protesting in Tiananmen Square with my father. I will never forget the newfound feeling of hope and possibility that this could be the moment that would change everything. That might mean my dad could go home again to Tibet after 30 years in exile. At that point, Tibet had been rocked by protests for nearly two years, and martial law had been declared in Lhasa that March. Just weeks later, seeing a million Chinese citizens taking to the streets, it seemed as if change had to be imminent. But that opportunity for change was lost, and not just because of the crackdown, but because in the years that followed, the free world lost its way in holding Beijing accountable. This happened in large part because we started ignoring what this authoritarian power was capable of. We allowed Chinese leaders to hijack critical discussions about rights, muting nearly all public debate, and eventually to even write the terms of engagement. Clearly, we got it wrong, and every day makes it clearer just how wrong. Faced with the escalating crisis of repression today, I believe we must ask ourselves, what can we do differently? The answer lies at the heart of what the students did in Tiananmen Square and what the Tibetans did in Lhasa in 1989. The answer lies in courageous, principled, unyielding action to fight for what is right. If six million Tibetans, armed with nothing more than nonviolent resistance, and the Buddhist monk as their leader can stand up to China time and time again, so can the rest of the world. As they have shown us, we have to speak truth to power, using every tool and avenue available to engage in bold, creative, and strategic resistance. And as part of this, like-minded governments need to confront China as one, engaging in joint public initiatives to support Tibetans and all others fighting for their rights and freedom. 
We are here today not just to mark a historic moment or because things have gotten so much worse, but because we have to act to right the wrongs of the past and to pick up from that moment 30 years ago that was alive with hope and possibility and this time to get it right. Thank you. I am not Speaker Pelosi. <laughs> I'm also not Chairman McGovern. Uh, they'll be here soon, I think, to, and uh, Jim McGovern, who is a congressman from my home state, so he would be the only person in the audience that could understand my Boston accent. <laughs> but I, while I'm here, let me talk to you a little bit about what Ned is doing. Uh, Ned is a remarkable organization. And it was founded by, as I said, President Reagan giving a very famous speech, which I encourage you all to go back and read. Is in Westminster. President Trump is over in England right now. Yes, this was a big speech that President Reagan gave, but it was a call to action for the world, all of the world democracies. Uh, the people in Congress heard that call, and they passed with a lot of effort. A bill that passed with bipartisan support. In fact, it couldn't have passed if it hadn't had bipartisan support. And it created the National Endowment for Democracy about 34 years ago. Carl Gershman has been the president of the organization, and he is the one who has planted the seeds, fertilized the fields, watered the seeds so that they could grow. And he is truly, I, I'm going to say, he deserves the biggest goddess of democracy award. <laughs> But the, the board of directors, or the board of, of that manages the National Endowment for Democracy includes Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, academics and workers, not to say academics don't work. <laughs> there are diplomats, there are thinkers, and Jim McGovern is here. <laughs> uh, Jim McGovern, uh, as I mentioned, is from my home state. He's from, the, he's from Worcester. You'll call, if you read it, you'd say Worcester, but he's from Worcester. <laughs> and Jim has been a real remarkable student of Congress for a long time. He worked for a, a, a great member of Congress, Joe Moakley, and that's when I first came to know him. But I know him from his family in Worcester and from the background in Worcester. He's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He makes of uh, the Rules Committee, even more important. <laughs> he wears a very large ring, and everybody has to kiss it. Uh, Jim McGovern has been a, a strong, strong advocate for spreading freedom, freedom, making sure justice is done. He's been courageous about doing that long before it was fashionable, and we're proud to have him as a supporter of the National Endowment of Democracy and what we do, and he's going to present our final award. Thank you, Jim, for being here. It's great to see you. Well, let me thank Andy Card, who I'm a big fan of. You know, um, in Massachusetts, um, Republican and Democrats work together, and uh, something we all need to do better down here in Washington. But I'm a big fan of Andy Card's, and he's been a great uh, leader up in Massachusetts and on the national level. And I'm really thrilled that he's so involved with um, NED and um, with and I, Cal Gershman. I want to what, what, there, right there. He is. Thank you so much for uh, your leadership, and you know. Um, Andy mentioned that I'm from Worcester, Worcester and, um, you know, that he knows my family, well, uh, you know, who's from Worcester. A lot of people down here think that because my last name is McGovern that I'm related to George McGovern. Um, and people come up to me all the time and say, I'm a, I've always been a longtime supporter of your dad's. And um, 
and I, and I usually say thank you. Um, my dad owns a liquor store in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I hope you'll keep on supporting him. So, and it's, and I'm, I just see my friend Frank Wolf here, who is uh, again a, a leader and a hero. Uh, on these issues. Um, there's so many good people here. I just want to let you know, the reason why we're late, we just, we just finished a vote on uh, the bill that I, uh, I had on the floor today, uh, remembering those um, who lost their lives in Tiananmen Square and urging the government of China to respect human rights. This bit, we, so we had a recorded vote, and as when I left, it was 423 to nothing. Um, everybody. So we get everybody on record. <clears throat> So since 2017, the Chinese government has locked up perhaps more than one million Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in mass internment camps. Uh, we should know the number of detainees by now, but we don't, because the Chinese government refuses to disclose it. We know these camps are an attempt to stamp out the Uyghur identity. Detainees face daily brainwashing, uh, abuse, and starvation diets. They are forced to denounce Islam, to study Xi Jinping thought, and to sing in praise of the party. Meanwhile, some of their children, left without parents, are made into wards of the state. The Uyghurs living abroad cannot contact families and friends from home. And when those, and when the, and when those loved ones disappear, they have no way to know if they're living or they're dead. The scope of the Uyghur crisis includes more than these camps, however. Uyghurs on the outside live in what experts depict as an open-air prison where they are subject to constant surveillance, facial recognition cameras, iris scanners, and police checkpoints. It is long past time for the world to send a clear message that the Chinese government cannot perpetrate these abuses with impunity. The World Uyghur Con Congress is fighting against this brutal oppression. Their mission to promote democracy, human rights, and freedom for the Uyghur people through nonviolent means can serve as a model for others in the years to come. The World Uyghur Congress has been in the lead in tirelessly advocating to call the world's attention to the plight of the Uyghur people, and in doing so, it has shined a bright light on how this systemic and technologically advanced repression may shape China going forward. As an organization of all the Uyghur people worldwide, the World Uyghur Cong Congress is working to establish a peaceful settlement through dialogue and negotiation. They serve as defender of the identity of their people and an inspiration to others. And so I am pleased to present them with Ned's 2019 Democracy Award. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Mick Jim McGovern and the President Carl Greshman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and the Congressman, Congresswoman, and the all friends who join us today. The World Uyghur Congress is deeply and proud, honored to receive this award to recognition of work advocating for the right of the Uyghur people despite immense challenges. I would like to sincerely thank National Endowment for Democracy. We have made visible progress over the past year, despite hard challenges, and this would not have been possible without support of National Endowment for Democracy. I would like to acknowledge the teamwork, World Uyghur Congress leadership, staff, and all those Uyghur diaspora who support us. I would also like to thank all the academics, journalists, activists whose important contribution have made significant difference. While we are deeply proud and honored to receive this award, we cannot lose the focus. Despite best effort and the all progress we had made in the past year, the concentration camp arbitrary detaining millions of Uyghurs have not been closed. Despite all of our work, Uyghur in Turkestan are suffering and being denied and their most basic rights. We are still missing our family, friends, and who have disappeared into the concentration camps today. In this moment, 
We can celebrate great strides we have made over the past year, but our work is not done. In the coming year, we must redouble our efforts. We cannot stop until all those detained in the camp have been freed. We will not rest until the Uyghur people enjoy democracy, human rights, and the freedom. It is a time entire world stand up for the Uyghur. It is a time, it is a time free for three million Uyghur who are suffering in the concentration camp. I think it is a time also US Congress passed approve the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. Thank you for your attention. We are so fortunate to have the Speaker of the House here. I mentioned before when I started that this is the 100th, literally, this is the day of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution being passed by Congress and sent to the states for ratification. <laughs> the personification of being a suffrage envoy is Nancy Pelosi. She is someone who grew up in politics with a passion for participation. Uh, she made sure the we in our Constitution does apply to everyone. She was an outstanding public servant who became a congresswoman, who became a leader, who became a speaker. And she's been a committed advocate for human rights. She has been passionate about that which the National Endowment for Democracy does. For many years, she's been one of the most vocal members of Congress on issues such as Tibet. And she remembers Tiananmen Square and won't let anybody else forget it. She's been among the most reliable friends of the National Endowment for Democracy. And we are honored that she is not only here today, but she has been there every time we needed her to be there to help. She gained her leadership in part because of her partisanship. But she's been leading us in helping to spread democracy with no partisanship with an invitation for everyone. And she has made sure that invitation is active every day in Congress when it comes to the work of the National Endowment for Democracy. So with that, we are grateful for the trust and privilege that she has shown us, and we show her great respect. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate uh, those very kind words of introduction, especially coming from Andy Card, uh, Andrew Card. He is, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, he is a, a respected uh, leader in his own state of Massachusetts. You can still detect the wonderful glow of his Massachusetts accent. And he is, uh, again, uh, on the other side of the aisle from us, but on the same side of all of the issues that relate to the dignity and worth of people. I was so delighted when I heard that he was willing to uh, uh, take the responsibility at the National Endowment for Democracy uh, because his reputation is so um, magnificent on both sides of the aisle, both sides of the Capitol, up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, and all over the country, in Texas, too. Right? In Texas, too. So thank you, Andy Card, for your kind, very, very generous and kind words, which I accept on behalf of my colleagues. As Frank Wolf uh, will tell you, we always did the, all of our work together in a bipartisan way. We were bipartisan in what we advanced. We were bipartisan in precedents we criticized of both parties <laughs> in what they didn't do. 
and I'm, I'm excited uh, uh, to be here. Carl Gershman, thank you for your tremendous, tremendous leadership. You would think at some point he might burn out, <laughs> but he just keeps glowing. He just keeps that flame going uh, about his passion, his ardor for, again, respecting the dignity and worth of every person all over the world, wherever they are. Uh, for all of us, it is a challenge to conscience to see what the Chinese government did 30 years ago. What a sad thing, really, behavior outside the circle of civilized human behavior. Some people are here. I was reminiscing with Wer Kashi. He has his, uh, his Uyghur name there now, but Wer Kashi, when we met him. And when he came back, when he came back from, he came right after it happened, like a matter of, it seemed like days to us, he was testifying in Congress. Remember Frank and Chris Smith was there, bipartisan way, Tom Lantos had the hearing, and he came, this boy, really, he tells me he was 21 years old, but a young person of college age, so much courage. And when he came to the Capitol, and others came with him, but he was sort of one of the, the, the names that we all knew, the cameras were ablaze. The whole world understood what happened. And uh, the, the courage was just so dazzling of all of these young people. Now, today we have many veterans of Tiananmen here, all of whom uh, demonstrated that courage, all of whom uh, the command I respect, all of whom, each of whom has taught us a lesson about courage and not forgetting. So I'm, I couldn't be here earlier because we had two things simultaneously interwoven on the floor. We had the, uh, the, dreamers, the Dreamers Bill, that, you know, that was very important to many of us. And then in between the Dreamers Bill, they decided to take up the vote on the uh, 30th anniversary commemoration resolution. And so I couldn't move because I wanted every single vote. Everybody said, well, you have, a, you have a majority. You can leave now. I'm not leaving. You have two-thirds. You can leave now. I'm not leaving. I want the message to be clear that the House of Representatives voted unanimously every single vote, and they did. And they did. And they did. <laughs> and again, I accept that on behalf of all of my uh, my colleagues, Ileana Roslight, my girlfriend, I'm so glad she's back here, my girlfriend, uh, she knows I miss her, but she knows how hard it is to get 100% of the vote of the floor. Right, Frank, you, you too, because the Chinese government, they were threatening me all day. I can just imagine what they were doing, the embassy, with the rest of the members, but 100% of the vote saying, we remember, we will not forget. The Congress. The House of Representatives, it was great. So here we are, so here we are, a challenge to the conscience of our country, a challenge to the conscience of what, 30 years ago, how could it be? In some ways it seems so recent, in other ways it seems so three decades away, a long time. But the, uh, the just reemergence of so many people at this time I guess, as I said today at the rally, the 30 years should be a sufficient evidence that the policy that our country has ad adopted toward China in the hopes of getting better trade policy, better security policy, and better human rights policy simply hasn't worked. And we might want to try a different approach. So it's, a, it's, a very, uh, it's very interesting to think that we saw at that time, 30 years ago, before some of you were born, all of these, a million in, in Tiananmen and there and all over, the, all over China, all of these young people coming forth, supporting our founders, having a, a goddess of democracy that, that looked like our Statue of Liberty, and then to have that snuffed out. A, a few, several years later, the Chinese invited me as speaker to come in a, a re, uh, shall we say, let's redo our friendship, because for all those years they were saying I was the most hated person in China. So <laughs> they, they <laughs> I, I wore that as a badge of honor. And uh, in any case, they said, let's reset our friendship. 
So we're gonna, you're going to come, Speaker of the House, and we're going to. And I said, we'll go and we'll talk about uh, climate change because that was some place where we had common ground. But I said, you can't expect me not to talk about human rights. It just, it just isn't possible. But why I bring it up is because on the way over, we had all this reading and film and all the rest of it. And what was so sad, because that was like, what, maybe 10 years ago. What was so sad about it was that, it was 09, I guess. That was so sad about it was that they, the, the man beh before the tank, the man before the tank, one of the most iconic visuals in the world, and all that it symbolized was totally unknown to the students in China. When some people ask them, what does this mean to you, holding it up, they say, oh, is that a commercial for something in America? Is that a commercial for something in America? It's a commercial for democracy. It's a commercial that we're with the man before the tank, not with the man who ordered the tanks out. But imagine that they have completely eradicated that image, had complete, maybe now with more social uh, media and the rest, that some of that will be made known to some people there other than the people of Hong Kong. And aren't we proud of them, the way they, the way they turned out? <laughs> so in any event, I, I just want to share some thoughts with you because this is a very emotional thing for all of us. I don't think anybody went back more than Frank. He, he was in the prison. Beijing prison number one, seeing what they were doing with prison labor. I mean, this we were so, and have been and continue to be, so close to this issue. And we thought we were going to get some cooperation if we could prove, and Frank did prove, that what they were doing was wrong. But, but we couldn't convince a Democratic or a Republican president to agree with us. So in any event, uh, just to say that we remember the Uyghurs, what, three million is it? Where? About three million in education camps? What? And why are why is the world not speaking out? We have to. And I've said to the people in the Muslim world, these are your Muslim brothers and sisters, you've got to speak out. The Tibetans, so sad, their religion, their culture, their language, trying to snuff that out. Uh, the, um, in Hong Kong, oh my gosh, so scary, extradition, legislation which puts everybody there at risk. One country, two systems. What two systems are they? None of them is acceptable uh, in terms of how they view uh, democracy. And with journalists, lawyers, authors, human rights activists, and all the rest, so, so at risk in Beijing and throughout China. So it all is still happening. It's getting worse, I think, than even when we visited China that year, and then when we visited Tibet recently under this pr current president, President Xi, I, it, it seemed worse than even under President Hu. So we have important work to point out. This is a challenge to our conscience, and as I said over and over again, if, if we do not speak out for human rights in China because of an economic relationship, we lose all moral authority to talk about human rights any place in the world. In the world. <laughs> so Dr. Bob Fu of the Tibet Action Institute, World uh, Uyghur Congress, Dalton, is that? Uh, oh, to um, London, Taofong, Tang, yeah. Just Tang, Ta Tang. Congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, congratulations, congratulations to all of you. I have that uh, goddess of democracy, and I display it with great pride in my office. Thank you, Thomas Marsh, uh, for uh, uh, make, make, uh, uniting us all with that beautiful, beautiful statue. And that it comes to you from the National Endowment for Democracy is such a great uh, uh, imprimatur. There could be none better than to say what a champion you are, how we all re globally recognize that. Thank you for your courage. Congratulations on the recognition you are receiving 
we still have very important work to do. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some points.